Uh, I, uh, I wanted to come here to talk about um, if it's uh, how to make a zero cost Lua C API abstraction. So the last talk, you know, kind of interface with the C API directly. Um, this one's going to be about how to wrap that up so you get a little bit more mileage out of it. Um, so that it's a lot easier to do things like uh, mess with lots of functions or find different classes and find different variables, things like that. Um, and of a, of particular importance to us is to not only have that, but to see if we can assert that it's also a zero cost compared to using the plain C API. Um, so really, you know, one of the big questions you know, when I was going forward in this, uh, one of the big questions uh, while going forward in this is going to be uh, if we can achieve uh, zero overhead. And uh, I mean, <coughs> from what I found out, um, in fact, it's no problem at all. Uh, so let's dive in a little bit here. Um, so for starters, I'm just kind of running over the Lua and the Lua C API. Um, the Lua language is, is great. Um, simple, well-designed, clear goals. I very much like the, the Lua language. Um, works out very well for large parts of uh, large applications and small applications and other stuff. Um, the Lua C API, though, is a little bit uh, different. Um, it's stateful, it's stack-based, um, it has good documentation, and it's mostly clear semantics and mapping aside from like, you know, surprises with like length and stuff, um, you know, when trying to find sequences and whatnot. Um, so, you know, the Lua language is good, but the C API is a little bit uh, crusty. And I, I wanted to define a little bit what that means. Um, you know, so I talked about it being stack-based. Um, that's hard to drop for some developers at times. Um, they, just, they don't want to have to think about the overhead while they're using the thing. Um, they often think in terms of, you know, I want to call a function or I want to access a table. They don't really think about how I need to push this thing onto the stack. And, 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 you know, they don't want to really think in those terms. Um, also, uh, things that are simple in Lua and easy, um, you know, like you've seen in a lot of presentations, you know, very, very complex thing kind of boiled down to very small amounts of code. Um, it's n not necessarily simple in the C API. Um, there can be an incredible amount of boilerplate, and you know, trying to efficiently manage the stack is, is, is a little bit difficult. Um, but the it's not that the C API can't do simple things. So, for example, if you want to access, you know, some global my table and you know, value A or whatever, right? You, you know, the, the steps of the C API, you know, kind of high level pseudo code is just you know, get my table global, get the field A, and then use Lua 2 value, whatever, and then you can get what you're looking for. Um, similarly, if you want to call, you know, some uh, global function my func, uh, and just an argument or whatever, you push the my func global function, you know, onto, onto the stack, you know, you push your arguments, um, which in this case is just two. Uh, and then you call it um, a Lua call, a Lua p call, and then you get the return values um, back. Um, and then you know you use Lua two or whatever, Lua two integer or whatever else you know you would get your certain function. And then you know you, you do some stack thing back there, so you pop you know uh, in, the, in the results and make sure that in the stack next to Try doing that in the Lua C API, um, and you will be reduced to tears. Uh, it's very painful to do that properly. It's very painful to keep the stack clean. Um, it's very painful to uh, know, uh, to do all that and to make sure that your stack is perfectly right so that after you've done evaluating my table A, B, and my func 2, that it's also ready to be called by other func. Um, in other words, the C API doesn't scale. And it, it, I don't mean it doesn't scale in terms of speed. I mean it, turn, it doesn't scale in terms of the amount of necessary boilerplate to do something. Um, and so it costs a lot of developer time uh, to get these things going, and that's that's a little bit uh, borderline. I mean, you know, it's it's acceptable previously because that's all we had, but with the tools we have now, I'm beginning to think it's starting a little bit unacceptable. So we're going to see if we can make it just a little bit better. Um, also, one of the things that's not necessarily uh, uh, the Lua C API as well, but kind of limitation of C, is that there's no overload. Um, so here's a bunch of different functions that you can use to get stuff out of like a table or out of rules. Um, and so some of them take strings, some of them you need the integer for, some of them are for raw versions. One of them is only available in Lua 5.3 or above. Uh, so, you know, developers who develop against the C API can often get tripped up really fast about like what functions, should, what things they should be calling. Um, and so, you know, uh, when it comes to writing general purpose routines, Sometimes people fall back on the most general things like uh, get table um, with the after pushing you know some value onto the stack um, when that might not be the most efficient thing to do, but it's just the, it's just the most easiest thing they could think of doing, so they just did that. Um, 
So that's kind of a, lim a limitation, not just of the Lua C API, but kind of C in general. So we want to wrap it up. Um, we know that we have, we know that you know in the in the last slide we saw here that you know this takes a string or you know C string, this takes an integer. So the types tell us what we need to do. Um, so maybe we can use a little bit of overloading or dispatching to ease a little bit of that uh, developer uh, cognition about what exactly I need to be messing with. Um, and maybe we can stuff a lot of the implementation details for the stack in some various functions and other things that you know we can reuse a lot. Um, so, and the other thing is, is that we want more, uh, more power, um, a little more meat than those wraps would be nice. Um, we want to handle higher level complex operations. We want to be able to do things like call other fun with my table A and B and the results of my fun called with two and just be able to make them all one line and not have to, you know, have this 15, 20 line of stack code that they figure out. And then be like, oops, I actually forgot to pop something off the stack, you know, now the whole thing's ruined. Um, we want to have tables with nested lookup and not have that be a pain. And you know, as a bonus, we want to have structured data. So we want to mimic C and C++ structures and stuff like that. And we want it to be kind of nice, nice to work with. So to solve this problem, um, a library was developed. Um, it was really just called Soul. Um, it was started by uh, a person by the name of Danny Y, or his online handle Wraps. Um, it's he went unmaintained because he had a very he he's an oncologist, so he's not actually a programmer. He's just an oncologist. Um, and he developed this as kind of a side thing for a build system that he was working on. He did, and he wanted to make it sort of really small and fit on the thumb drive. So he picked like Lua plus Ninja, and he was working on you know adding some extra functionality using C. Um, and so he built uh, Soul, um, and then kind of like left it alone. Um, while he was doing that, I kind of found the project, um, and so I started actually like, actively developing and helping him a lot. Um, but he was busy and had other things to do, so I just had kind of like a bunch of pull requests kind of sitting dead in the original process. I think that, I think like three of my pull requests are still open to this day. Um, so it got forked, um, and it was rewritten and developed in Soul 2. Um, and so just disclaimers, um, I am the author of Soul 2, um, so this talk's going to be a little bit biased. Um, when I mention zero cost, that means I'm going to show you some benchmarks, and I benchmark like 13 other Google libraries. Um, so I did a lot of uh, reading of every, a lot of other libraries, a lot of other designs, the documentation, how all that squared out. Um, and you know, obviously, you know, because I've been developer so too, I'm a little bit biased, um, but I did make sure to email the other library authors to be like, you know, am I using it properly? You know, am I not misrepresenting you? That kind of stuff. Um, so you know, all of them got back to me, all the library developers for all the libraries that are still in development, um, got back to me the proper use of notes and how to use the stuff. So, that was good. <clears throat> I'm also not necessarily doing like a bunch of hand-rolled loop stuff. Um, there's this library called Nunius, um, which uh, basically performs statistically significant benchmarks. It's like the Google, it's like the, uh, the Google benchmark um, uh, suite that's out there. Um, but it's a lot of, I think it's a lot better than the Google one. Um, and it's a lot better than me just handling a bunch of loops and then like, calling a bunch of like, time functions. It's, uh, it, it really goes through and makes sure that um, it's collecting multiple samples, multiple iterations, making sure that everything's kind of uh, statistically significant. Um, so I'm not just kind of like, oh, well, I have to have a really good run in this time, and you know, my numbers look okay. So let's start, I guess, with how we wrap up the stack. Um, so this is the core of the sole API. Uh, the disclaimer, you're, you're almost never going to see this, um, because this is, still, this is still too ugly. Um, you know, um, so even though we've got down to a couple simple function calls, even though we have things like get field and set field, and we can make you know stack references and you know, refer to things and get the stack index with these function calls, um, and even though the like, things like figuring out whether it's a global table or not is kind of like all baked into these 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 function calls in these namespaces, uh, this is still too ugly. This isn't you know as simple as I would write the code in Lua. Again, in Lua, I would just write you know you know I would just access the key, I just access the table some key, or I just access some key and get the value out immediately. You know, So this still isn't quite nice, but this serves as the basis for us to get going. And at the bottom here, this is kind of linked to the, uh, the doc, so that you, you know, if you really want to see it, you can, you can kind of go read through all the, uh, all the, uh, the pain in there. Um, but I wanted to kind of show where we wanted to get, or what we did end up. Um, so 
here's a you know, basic config down the look. Um, we've got some numbers, we've got a string, there's a table in there, and we've even got a function in there. Um, so we want to be able to mess with this, or we want to at least read stuff from this. And we want to do it in a way that's nice in C or C++, um, preferably C++, because um, that's what you know, the, the library's built out of. Um, so we went ahead and, and did some of that. So this is how you mess with like a config, you know, load up a script and start messing with the numbers. And as you can see here, this starts to look remarkably close to what your Lua code would look like. So you're, I mean, we can declare a state, um, and so it's, it's we just call it Lua. Um, and so we open some libraries here. Um, you can specify multiple, but right now it's just you know uh, we're just opening up the base to get print, right? Because that that function call has print in it, um, so we need to have the base library. Um, then we load up the file, so we can script file and figure out So that that should all be easy to, to understand. Um, what's nice here is that you know Lua, you know open open uh, a bracket, um, open square bracket, and then just the number, and then the close bracket, and we can read out the number immediately. And what I like about this is that you know there's no stack management. You, you don't see any calls to the stack. You don't. There's no uh, finagling or anything, um, it's just one line. And that's exactly the way you would write it in Lua, or you know, almost exactly the way you would write it in Lua, right? Um, same here, um, you want to get out a string, um, you just reference a string. And what's nice about this is that it also supports nesting. So you can get some table, you can access some table and then access value and then pull out the actual value. Um, and I really like this, this syntax because it feels a lot like Lua. And that, that was to drive here. You know, I didn't want something that you know, had me reaching into states and calling like get global and stuff like that. I didn't want to think about that. I just wanted to be able to write code like this and have it behave properly. And here's one of the other nice things. Um, you know, if in, in other frameworks, uh, if, you, uh, if you try to act as something that's nil, so this is not defined in the config of Lua. Um, and then we try to access something that would you know, return nil if we were working with the stack. And if we do that, uh, then panic would be called. Um, and that would, you know, and the default the behavior of that is for you to go for, right? So your application would go down. Um, but using some type tricks in C++, we're able to uh, traverse this safely and basically be able to use uh, this kind of uh, optional class here. Um, basically, so it's like maybe hint, you know, if, if you were with Haskell, you have a maybe class. Um, I think there's also an optional book handle and stuff like that. But basically, this is like, you know, if it exists, work with it, if not, then don't. Um, so you can, it's basically, you can converse to a Boolean expression and say, you know, is it safe? Um, then get its value, otherwise don't. Um, and in this case, the de you'll get the default value, which is, you know, in this case, 24. Um, so, again, this is kind of like striving towards getting that really nice syntax and really nice way of working with the, uh, this, the, the, the Lua, working with Lua in general. Also, uh, functions work like the way, like the way they should. Um, so, we had a function in our config that was called bar, um, and we wanted to call it with important string. Now, we could get out important string and then pass it to this function, like the actual string value of C++, plus, but you can actually just directly reference a variable inside of Lua and then pass it to a sole function. And it will do exactly what you expect it to. And I really like this feature because, it, again, it takes away the burden of like you having to manage, okay, let me first convert to a string and then pass it to the function. It just implicitly understands you're referencing important string. I'm going to go get important string for you and call the function. And so, again, if you did this with the stack, if you did this you know, with the CAP with the stack, there'd be a lot of places where you could go wrong, where you could mess up. Um, but here, it just kind of works out of the box. And also a little bit of a, a demonstration here of using a, a, a C++ plus closure, or, or a lambda here. Um, you can kind of just set these things right off the bat, and uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, serializing the C function and then passing it in, or doing some other crazy thing with the user data and setting like an underscore, and setting the call meta method. Um, all this gets taken care of for you. And this will do exactly what you think. Thank you. So right now we're just calling that script, and the script calls you know this, this woo function we defined, and it prints out the data exactly like we expected to. So it's very easy to use and it's painless to set up, and that was what we were going for.
But now, you know, obviously, is, is it fast? And so these are the, the benchmark numbers. So lower is obviously better, because um, we want this is the execution time. And as you can see here, we're competitive with the plain C API, despite abstracting the entire thing away. So no stack management, none of that is involved, but we're just as fast as the C API. Now obviously, I mean, this, this all falls off um, in, in hilarious fashion, especially with Selenium. Um, but as you can see here, I mean, most of the frameworks that have spent a lot of time on this, uh, we all realize that you know, if we write our abstraction efficiently, we can uh, uh, deal with you know, not having the user manage the stack or like that and still get the performance that we need. Um, and so this is a, a very compelling argument in that you know, compilers and other things have reached a point where their optimizations are good enough that we don't have to necessarily worry about managing the stack or other different things. We can just write good code, we can write clean code, and we have well-designed code, and it's still just as good as if you, you know, wrote it all out by yourself. And so this, this is for getting something out of the global table. Um, this is for when you have a chain get, so when you go like some, when you go some table, and then you value, or you go some table, deeper table, you know, deeper table, and then you know, value. Um, and again, we're still just as competitive. As you can see here, we're also benchmarking the old soul. Um, and so we did poorly on this benchmark um, in, in, uh, back when it was owned by RAPS. Um, and Celine, I guess, I don't know. They're, they're doing something terrible here. Um, but as you can see here, again, it's this idea that you know, we don't really sacrifice any performance, so we actually have achieved kind of a zero cost, uh, uh, a zero cost abstraction um, without having somebody have to have the mental overhead of managing all that stuff. And you can see the same thing here um, with just calling a Lua function. So you know, setting something like Woof and then calling it, uh, it works really well. Um, it's a little bit faster than plain C API because I, I, I specifically implemented some kind of like ridiculous optimizations. Um, that are different from the way that you would uh, serialize and pass a Lewis C function to the plain C. Um, but uh, again, you know, it's, it's, it's very competitive is, is what I'm getting across here. Um, but that's, you know, I, so I mean, I showed functions, I showed tables, um, you know, I showed, you know, safety and some of those things. But one of the really compelling things is uh, can you bind structures, can you bind user data, you know, that kind of thing. Um, because that's the more complicated you know, aspect of Google. That's when you start dealing on meta tables. That's when you start, you know, okay, I have to find the index meta method and you know put it on a table and, and chain things. And so that's where things get complicated. So this was the big and the best part of Soul too. And so we have all these different ways you can bind stuff. So properties like Lua binds, you know, static functions, <coughs> functions, static variables, runtime extensibility, which is the big thing that a lot of people wanted. Um, meta methods that you can bind to yourself, and of course, you know, you can bind member functions and member variables. Um, and I thought I would just wall you with code, um, but I didn't want to. Uh, so I'm going to give you a live example um, about, um, of this. So, if I just tap out here. Um, so, this is this is Visual Studio. I mean, it's, it's not Linux, so I'm so sorry for all of you who love, who love GCC and everything. I'm, I'm unfortunate. Uh, Shackle into this compiler. Um, what? Oh yeah, I can. I can definitely. Uh, 
Um, and so this is what a user type binding looks like. Um, so we say new user type, we specify the type, and then we give it a name. So we're just going to give it the same name as, as it was called, so it's called var. And we want to bind a bunch of stuff to it. You know, we want to bind a member variable, we want to bind a function, we want to use a closure and pretend it's you know, a member or function. So we pass the self argument and then you can do some stuff with it. You know, we, we do uh, a lot of different things here. And you know, we also have some properties here. So we have a read-only property where we get the amount of jumps the, you know, in the vars. Um, we can also have a read and write property where you can have speed and you know, you set the speed as well. And one other thing that you know, I also talked about was static functions. So we have this high method here that doesn't really take a self argument or anything. You know, it's it's just the uh, the code we saw up here. Um, it's just it's just a bunch of you know free functions. So we just want uh, this high method here, but we want to do something special. We're gonna oh, we're gonna add some overloading to it, um, which uh, you know I'll show you what that what that looks like in a, in a second. So let's let's pop down here. Um, so we have a script here um, with a bunch of asserts and we're calling some functions and a bunch of other things, um, and so we create a new type of variable, my bars, um, and uh, we create basically a new thing with bars.new, kind of like table.new, uh, but, uh, you know. Um, and we, you know, we assert that jump to zero because that's what it's supposed to be default constructed to. We add jump, and then we call add jump again using the kind of explicit syntax here where we use dot and then we pass the, the self argument directly. Um, just to kind of see if it works. So let's let's run this and see if it works. And it does. So we added jump once and we added it again. Uh, we started with zero. And uh, if I can just shift this over because I can't see it. Um, the value is two. Um, so we know it works. Um, the other thing that's also neat is that you can grab the user data uh, out of uh, you grab the user data right out of the, the sole state here, or the, out of the state. So this vars here um, is pulled directly from the data inside of Lua. So you can uh, mess with the data directly in Lua. So as you can see, the jump is set to 2 like it was in Lua. The boost is still 5 and the velocity was actually just set to 50. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show something here for a second. When, um, when you... Uh, when you mess with something inside of a C++ and you get like a reference to something that was actually stored in Lua, um, you can you get the memory directly, which means you can mess with something both in Lua and C++. Um, and so you know we print the speed of my bars here, which we got out of Lua. Remember we set the speed uh, in C++, but when we print it in Lua, it shows 50. So we're able to access the memory both ways. Um, and in a very simple kind of syntax, in a very simple way. It doesn't require you to kind of go between two Lua, two user data, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and of course, you know, uh, everything kind of uh, is working out. Now, I wanted to uh, also show off, uh, you know, read-only variables, right? So jumps, as we had previously said it, was a, uh, uh, a read-only property. Um, so going through that, um, we try and do this, and we actually get an exception where it says, hey, I can't write to a read-only property. Um, so there's, so the framework actually has your back and will cover you when you try to do things that you're not supposed to, or things that you said you, you don't want to do. Um, and of course, this is just an example of the overloading I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, so you can overload a single function name. So vars.high is a static function, but it has two overloads. So when you pass it to a string, and it calls the, the, the second function that was added those two um, and says hello there. Um, the other one uh, is called the integer and it's overloaded and so we, got, we get calls from my one and we get the, the integer value. Um, so these are just some of the things that Sol supports um, that you don't have to do any stack management, you don't have to think about user data, you don't have to think about you know, any of that. It's just all handled for you. Yeah, so that's... <coughs> And so that's uh, that's that. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the. Uh, oh, okay. um, so I mean, I guess we could sort of skip over this. I mean, the implementation is actually fairly straightforward. We just have a meta table of functions, and it, it, the uh, thing indexes itself. And as you can see, again, 
member function calls competitive. You know, we don't necessarily have to lose any performance despite just doing all this hard work on the, on the back end for you. So we create the user data, we manage it all, and it's still just as competitive. Where we do lose out though is the variable implementation. So we have to call a C function to do that um, because we need to push the, the value of the return. We need to put the value of the variable directly onto the, uh, into Lua um, when, you, uh, uh, when you work with it. And so a lot of, a lot of frameworks actually don't support this. Um, and for good reason, because uh, it's complicated implementation and uh, it's hard to do right. Um, so we're not quite there yet. Um, so there's still some work we need to do to make variable access good. And I actually almost did it. I actually almost had it right. Um, so this is the speed implementation. So you have, a you have a meta table here that binds its new index to a second table and then passes it off. And then this meta table has all the function names on it. So when it looks for a function, it finds it in this table here. Um, and if it doesn't, then it goes, it calls the Lewis C function that will go off and you know, do like a map find for variables and whatnot. Anyone know what this, anyone uh, see a problem with this though? Well, the, the problem here is that uh, we can't use the speed method because the user data, the user data is uh, it's not the failed look of high number. So whenever you kind of do this this long cascading chain, the uh, the the thing that it passes to the Lua C function is not the user data that you initially failed the look upon. It passes the last table that it failed to look upon. So before it worked because this was only one. This was the new index method was only one removed from the user data. So it would pass the user data as, oh hey, I failed to look upon that. When we have this version, it fails all the way over here, so it passes the pass off table. So we don't have access to the user data anymore, so we can't actually get to the variables. So even though even though it's even though Lua is uh, extremely fast with um, using a table as an indexing method, um, it loses out because it, we always get this pass off table, and so we can't actually access the user data memory. Anymore. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways that we try to uh, uh, get around it. Um, I even found out that sometimes it leaves the user data like on the stack at like stack position negative one. So I was like, oh, maybe I can use some UB and like you know, actually stack stack you know negative one and and do that. And that almost worked, and then it stopped working. Um, like all UB does. So uh, couldn't do that. But when I but when it did work, the performance we actually had compare, comparable performance to the member function. So we were, we were back on target. Um, and so unfortunately, with, to make things correct and work properly, we take a 2x to 4x performance hit on all methods and variables. It's, it's just inevitable. Um, Carol Tuna, who, who responds to the Google mail list, actually passed this out in a Google JIT fork to make it so that this didn't actually happen. Um, and we also thought that, that maybe we could have a meta, day, meta table per user data. So we'll copy around a table with uh, user data. And, uh, this is actually a bad idea. So Lua wrapper and Lua CP interface actually copy around the red table every time they create a new user data. Um, so this would be the performance hit if we decided that to be our implementation. So we decided not to, we decided we'll just take the hit on the lookup instead. And that when you call member variables and functions um, for that specific thing. Um, we do kick in the special implementation though. Um, so this, you'll always have these numbers if you're only binding functions, um, but if you start binding variables, then we have to the special index lookup, and that's what needs to carry. Um, and so just uh, a quick note actually about Sol2. Um, it's been released a little, for like a little bit, um, since I guess like March and everything, and people actually didn't know that it, was, that it had all these features, that it had all these functions, because there were no documentation. Um, and so this is, I guess, a little bit of a plug to like always have documentation. Um, because we failed to kind of communicate that what Sol could do, um, nobody really picked it up. Uh, and so a lot of those frameworks like Selene and those other frameworks that did really poorly on those benchmarks and didn't have as many features, uh, were still uh, 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 like were still being picked over Sol too. Um, so it took us a while, but we actually do have like real documentation now that's actually like, uh, good. And so it's it's always important to have documentation um, because that's the one way that the users want to find. Um, and this is just a small quote actually from another one of the library developers. Um, Sol2 was actually the first binding library where we had to turn off runtime checks in order to be competitive with us. 
Um, and so that was kind of a, a really huge indicator that, you know, not only was Soul 2 kind of like uh, trying to uh, set the standard, but it also pushed other people to like really try to like optimize their implementations. And so just uh, uh, a couple things. Um, in order to fix the, the index new index thing that hits uh, variable tables, my tentative suggestion without knowing much about the implementation uh, is to add the original user data or table that triggers the whole lookup cascade as like an argument at the very end. Um, so this way it maintains backwards compatibility and I can still get you know, performance you know, below 5.4 or 5.6 or whatever. Um, and so just a quick thanks. Um, thanks to Professor Gail E. Kaiser who let me work on this um, last semester. Um, Ira Zhang who really fed the documentation and chewed into me. Um, uh, Kevin Brightwell who actually took sole interest, interest in Soul 2 for anyone else and completely improved the CI. We test across nine different platforms with like, very different pilots to make sure that it always works for whatever system that you're going to. Um, thanks to again the Lamb C plus bus who spent a lot of time kind of just telling me about my bad code. Uh, and like, leaving comments in, in Soul 2. Um, Elias Dallaire and Evie actually made blog posts about it, and that really boosted Soul's popularity. I think we're at like 350 something stars now, um, like 50 watches on GitHub. And Jason Turner, who actually encouraged me to do this presentation in the first place, and he, he runs something called CBD, uh, CBD Cast, and he actually presented about Soul before I even knew about it, before I even knew he was looking at it, um, at a conference called CBD, uh, 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 CBD Now. Um, and so he actually had like, really blown reviews about it, that's why I contacted him. Um, so thank you. Um, I know I'm holding up lunch, so I apologize for that. Um, but any questions, quick questions maybe? Yes. Okay, um, since you were using this code, are you also able to compile it with, let's say, MinGW, for instance? Yes, so it compiles with MinGW, it compiles with Visual C++, it compiles with Clang, all the way since like 3.4, it compiles with GCC, all the way since 4.9. Um, but then we, uh, Zero external dependency. Um, you just need Lua, um, and it's a single header, to, and it's a single header drop. So you just get the header, drop it in, and you start using it. Um, no, no, no dependency involved. Okay, I'm, I started for Okay, um, I know you don't have Lua Bridge on there on the benchmark. Right. Uh, so Lua in um was supposed to be like the spiritual successor to Lua Bridge. Um, so basically, it was Lua Bridge. Right? Um, so I only left that in there. I actually didn't know about Lua Bridge when I started these benchmarks. Um, I actually found, only found it about an after when Elias Dallaire, who was using Lua Bridge before he switched to Soul 2, um, told me about it. Uh, I think I might add it in there, um, but I mean, I already did 13 of them, and a lot of them had no docs, and I mean, implementing some of those benchmarks was a pain because they just, the, the, the library, ah! <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I'm sure Lua Bridge is, is probably a lot nicer than things like SLB3 and uh, um, but. You know, if, if I can get my hands on it, um, I'm, I'll, I'll probably have to do benchmark to see how well it scores up. Yes. Is there an easy way to see what the actual CA kind of calls are generated? Like, I've got a bunch of versions to see what sort of the complete generated. Yeah, um, so to do that, you have to basically like, look at the assembly. Um, you, know, you have to like, file the response and then look at the assembly. Um, when we were running all these benchmarks, we, I ran it against the Lua DLL so that all the uh, Lua CA guy calls wouldn't be like, optimized out. Um, if, you, if you look at a static link, then there's, there's a new thing called whole program optimization and link time code generation, where you know, even if you have a static library, um, the compiler will be able to look at the object code in the static library and then basically use that to do the inline. Um, so it's, it's really, it's, the compiler is really smart, basically. Um, so you know, you'd have to compile it as a DLL to make sure it doesn't get like, inlined away, and then you'd be able to see all the different functions. Yes, I don't know, this is pretty debug debugging one especially. Um, when I was trying to debug code using this sort of you know, driver API before, always, I, I, I can see what the issue would be if it was using the C API, but then I have absolutely no idea how that C API will be generated from the templates. I have yeah. no idea how to. Yeah, so that's, that, that is one of the, I guess, the, the problem when having have these big wrapper libraries. Um, there's, there's a lot there, there's a lot of code play. Even though it gets optimized out by the compiler, there's still like the, the developer problem of like, okay, well, if there's a problem, how do we kind of get through this? Um, the good news is uh, I fix bugs in less than 24 hours. Um, like, hey, like, I'm just, not suggesting bugs Yeah, no, no, I, I know what you mean. It's just, um, you know, somebody, there's, there's one or a couple people who have to basically bear the burden of what the internal implementation is. And I have some internal docs, but they're not expensive enough for like somebody else. Somebody else would have to have some knowledge of like C++ and templates to be able to walk through this. Um, but, and is, um, is there anything you can do to sort of make the templates emit, 
Uh, yeah, there there are ways to do that. Um, there are attempts to debug it and stuff, um, but I haven't really like, gotten a hold of them. Um, I'm just kind of relying on you know these like, compilers and all these kind of techniques. I mean, uh, on the next slide, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm talking about bug hunting, but I mean, such a little ones like I tore through every single compiler. I was playing Visual C++ was a nightmare. Um, or GCC, um, I found so many different compiler bugs, and I mean, at this point, like, I'm very, very good at C++, uh, so that's why I can fix things so fast and all that stuff. But there, there, there is just, like, a, over, a mental overhead that a developer will have to, if they want to contribute to the library, which, which is bad, right? You know, you want it to be easy for people to contribute, but at the same time, you want this nice abstraction with the speed, so at some point, you have to call it, call it quits and say, or actually do it. So that's just how, that's just how it is. Some people have to read. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but, uh, thank you very much.